ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're shortly moving on to our next plenary session. Uh, towards the end of this session, you will find helpers from Terry coming round, distributing some voting devices. Those of you who were here yesterday, I think, very much enjoyed using those because we're going to have a little, uh, a little plebiscite later in the afternoon. So you can look forward to that. Um, meanwhile, you don't have to wait for a voting device to vote for your favorite exhibitor in the Green Innovation exhibition, which is outside. If you pull out the uh, little leaf that's within your summit brochure, you'll find the opportunity to vote. If you vote for your favorite exhibitor, the winner is gonna be announced uh, at the end of proceedings on Saturday, and they will get a prize, which I'm sure I'll share with you. So, um, so do feel free to vote for your favorite exhibitor. If you haven't checked out the Green Innovation exhibition, please do so. There's lots of stuff which brings all the theories we've been hearing about in the hall to life. You can also have a look at the BMW, the BMW i8 car, which is outside. This is a revolutionary plug-in hybrid mixture of electric and fossil fuels with the emphasis on electric. It's very sporty. It puts the sexy into sustainability. I'm not sure they'll let you take it for a test drive, but maybe you could... Uh, you could sit in the driver's seat and pretend. So that's outside, do feel free to, to check that out. And now we're going to be uh, shortly moving on to the next plenary, which is entitled, Air Pollution is a Solvable Problem. It's certainly a problem which needs solving. I come from London, and as a small child, I can distantly remember the London fogs which now have a rather romantic ring to them, but they were killers. They were killer pollution caused by all the coal fires that we burned at the time. And until recently, we thought that problem was solved. But in the last few years, we've seen pollution levels in London rising and rising. And that's partly, ironically, because of government encouragement some years ago for people to switch from petrol to diesel because diesel produces fewer carbon emissions. So that's uh, an example of the law of unintended consequences. We now have so serious air pollution in London, as we do in many other cities of the world, Delhi included. Despite the Herculean efforts of the government shifting from diesel to CNG, Delhi is also experiencing dangerously high levels of air pollution. So we have a big problem. We need it solved. It's encouraging that the title of this session, therefore, is air pollution is a solvable problem. And I'd like to invite up our panelists who are gonna help share how to solve this problem. Uh, we have Mr. Kamal Bali, Managing Director of Volvo India Private Limited. We have Dr. Carlos Dora, Coordinator, Public Health, Environmental and Social Determinants of Health Department, the World Health Organization. We have Dr. Dirk Franser, Managing Director of the Flemish Institute of Technological Research. We have Dr. Sunday Leonard, the Science Program Officer at the UN Environment Program. We have Dr. Ajay Matur, Director General of Terry. And we have the Chair, we have Dr. Professor Ramanathan, Distinguished Professor, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at the University of California. And I'm getting a last minute message. He says, trying to read a very small piece of writing. Ms. Abu Bakr from the Federal Ministry of Environment in Nigeria, who's already won the prize for the most flamboyantly dressed panelist of the afternoon. So uh, please come and join us. And I will now hand over to your moderator for the session. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have our full panel, and it's my uh, true honor to be moderating and chair this session. And the title of the session is Air Pollution is a Solvable Problem. I uh, have a good track record making predictions. In 1980, I had predicted that global warming would be detected by year 2000, and IPCC was then 
announced in 2001 about global warming being detectable. But eight years ago, I have predicted that we will shoot past this two degree threshold in another 30 years. So we'll see how that happens. So with that track record, I'm going to make a prediction today. In about a week, all of you will forget what happened in this session. So, I, but if I'm sure that happens. So I want to make three points which I hope you'll remember. The first is, Air pollution is a solvable problem. The second point I hope you'll remember, particularly to deliates, cleaning up the air does not hinder development or economic growth. The third, for each rupee you spend in cleaning the air, the benefits you get is at least 30 times that much. So I'm making these based on the experience of California, which is a living laboratory for cleaning air pollution. Our chair talked about how polluted London is. In 1960s, the, I live in San Diego, within a couple of hours is Los Angeles, was competing with London for the most polluted city in the planet. And they still is a little bit polluted, but it cleaned up remarkably. The other thing I want to say, this is the time to solve the air pollution problem in India. Because with this Clean India campaign, the Swachh Bharat, we have support from the highest level of government for this problem. So that's not going to happen that often. So this was the premise of 26 experts two-thirds of them from India, and a third drawn from US, Germany, and Sweden, we wrote a report which we are going to release today. So that report is titled Breathing Air, 10 Scalable Solutions for Indian Cities. And our solution was supposed to be here on the screen. Can someone show that? Or? The circle. Anyway, uh, if it's not there, uh, we'll pretend it's there. So I'm holding this in my hand, right? Very nice. Thank you. So on the outer circle, you see the sectors contributing to the pollution. And the reason for the circle is that they are interconnected. Just to give you one example, when you go out, Roughly a third of the particles you breathe in is what we call ammonium sulfate. The ammonia comes from agriculture, likely Punjab. The sulfur comes from coal plants in Uttar Pradesh. They both travel to Delhi, decide to get married, and become ammonium sulfate. So to clean the ammonium sulfate, you have to attack both the agriculture and power. Likewise, are those five sectors. You can't separate them. Okay? So it's a multi-sectoral problem. The second thing is air pollution is also multi-scale. For example, this analysis done in this report, uh, he's a young scientist from Terry. He was the lead author, Dr. Sumit Sharma. He showed the daily particulates you're breathing only 25% comes from Delhi's emission. Another 20%, sorry, one third, another 20% comes from what's this called NCR, National Capital Region, okay? 10 times the area of Delhi. So 40% of the pollution comes from outside Delhi and outside the National Capital Region, from Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh from the south, and even likely from Mumbai. So to attack the air pollution problem, you need cooperation and collaboration between cities within a state, between states. So that's why our top solution, we are calling for a clean air mission, which will cut across the sectorial 
issues and scale issues. Okay? Then you can go on and on about all the other nine solutions, and I'm not going to, I want to give the other panelists a chance. But I want to tell you, all of these solutions have been carefully reviewed over the last two, three years by our group, and we chose just, just those which have worked. Just look at the one under dust and waste. We are talking about ban open burning, waste burning. That's the first thing Los Angeles did in the 1960s. It cut their pollution by almost 25%. Okay? So these are simple steps. Of course, it's very complex and very difficult to implement. So I'm not uh, making this simpler. But the solutions are there. This report, which I have a pleasure, I'm going to release it now, also lists in our table two the tremendous number of steps India is already taking. For example, in the transport sector, India has already said by 2022, they will leapfrog from bar at four to bar at six. So these are our solutions. We are just leveraging of what's already being done. So the new thing we are trying to contribute here is, while cutting the transport emission is very important, you cannot ignore all the other sectors. They all have to be brought down at the same time to make a perceptible impact on the particulates, toxic pollutants, which enter the lungs of our children. Okay? So that's the introduction. I would like our panelists to give their contributions. Can we pass it around? So like I said, many institutions are part of, uh, participate in this. Terry is the lead institution. So can I request the panelists to open the ribbon and we hold it and we take a picture of releasing this report? Yes. So I'm going to request each of the panelists to make about five minutes remarks, and then we'll have some time for open questions. May I invite uh, Dr. Ajay Mathur. Well, thank you very much. It has been a great pleasure to participate in the preparation of this report. Uh, Professor Ramanathan very kindly uh, said that Terry led the report. While that's technically true, I think we drew most of our inspiration from him. Um, and I want to thank him for, in a sense, making it happen. And making it happen, I think, is the key challenge in bringing these 10 solutions to you and I. Now, all of us have been bothered by air pollution at least for the last 15 years in Delhi. Most of us have had runny noses, chest infections, headaches as a result of uh, poor air quality, which suddenly improves when you go out of Delhi. Yet, action has not happened. What is it that it will take to get these thin solutions off the ground? I think the first and foremost is that we need to ensure that you and I have a index that we can relate to, the air quality index. What that has done, and we saw it last winter, was to make the point that here is a problem. You could benchmark the index and say that we need to bring this down. Um, you know, Management 101 says what is measured is what is managed. We've crossed that threshold. I believe that's one of the major reasons why the, there was some action on air quality last winter. Now we come to the next level. One of the major issues that occurs in this area is that what suffers, what are the costs, are our health. It's a personal cost. 
It's also cost to our employers. But, and therefore, if this is improved, the benefits would be our health. But people who would have to do things are the owners of the fields around Delhi, the owners of the power stations, the people who actually carry out construction and lead to a huge amount of respirable particles being emitted when the buildings are being made, and from automobile pollution as well. Why will these people change their practices because of the amorphous benefit of improving my health. That is where public pressure comes in. Mm -hmm. We have seen public pressure work last uh, winter. It did convert into political action. Unfortunately, that has not been seen through. That is why at the center is this idea that we need a permanent group throughout the year. And this permanent group looks at all of these sectors, possibly has representatives from the various ministries, from the various interest groups which represent these sectors. You need to bring them at one place. They need to feel the pressure for change to happen. What I hope is that this report provides us all with a tool to move our agenda ahead on making the air cleaner. And I'll take you up on your uh, challenge. In fact, if I can join in, I will. Yes, I think we will have a cleaner, uh, we'll have cleaner air, certainly in Delhi and in most cities over the next 10 years. Fantastic. Okay, I'm hoping you will invite me 2026 Absolutely. for that. Okay, now I'm going to put, you know, this, honestly, this problem is not going to be solved with the cooperation from industry. So I'm going to put uh, our distinguished panelist from the industry on a spot and ask him to respond, Mr. Bali from uh, Volvo. He's head of Volvo in India. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Ram, and thank you, Mr. Mathur, for some very interesting opening comments. Thank you, Terry, for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, discussion this, this evening. Uh, let me take a step back and talk about what, can we, what are we actually doing on ground to solve these problems. Are these problems really solvable? What are the steps various stakeholders are taking in this? Let me, I will talk on behalf of Volvo Group a fair bit during my conversation here. Uh, let me uh, remind you that uh, the 17 sustainable development goals have been finalized by UN. And Volvo as a group has chosen to adopt four of them very, very sincerely and seriously. I will come to those in a minute. But I just want to share one very important myth which a lot of business leaders have. We believe that the business model for sustainable solutions is not sustainable. Hmm. I think this is a complete myth. So there are huge opportunities, business opportunities, in creating a business model which addresses these concerns if we can live up to those, those ambitions. Of course, there are technological issues. There are collaboration of stakeholders, which is very, very critical. So Volvo firmly believes that, and we have chosen four sustainable uh, development goals. Now, number one being health and safety. Safety has been core to Volvo for a very, very long time. I don't want to go into details of it. The second one is innovation and infrastructure, where we are saying it's very important to have innovation in our business model so that we can solve some of these challenges which are being posed onto the environment. For instance, electromobility is, is clearly Volvo solution going forward for all public transport. In Europe, we are going to stop manufacturing buses which run on fossil fuels. In India, we are bringing in hybrids. 
and then the next step would be plug-in hybrids and going forward completely electric buses. So that's very, very clearly the solution which we are talking when, when we talk of sustainable cities and sustainable communities, one of the very key aspect of it is sustainable transport. Sustainable transport means transport which is accessible by all. So, so whatever we bring in must pass three tests. Number one, socially inclusive. It can't be only for the rich, number one. Second is, it has to be economically viable, which means it must give more for less. It must be efficient. And third is environmentally friendly, which is what uh, is going to be the solution. So the third sustainable uh, development goal is sustainable cities and communities where we are going to work very, very seriously. And within the, for the long haul, we are looking at seven different fuels. We have worked for the last 10 years on, and we have proven to the world that we have finalized seven different fuels on which long haul trucks can, can work. These are zero or low emission fuels. And DME is our chosen uh, suggestion. We are working with Niti Ayo closely. And I'm sure this will see one day uh, to fruition. The last and the important uh, thing which we have chosen, fourth uh, sustainable development goal is protecting the planet. I think this is very important. Climate change, what Professor Ram talked about, is a very, very crucial issue. I think we owe it to our future generations uh, a little bit. And I think uh, that's very, very important. So electromobility, very, very clearly for, uh, 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 for passenger traffic, for urban transportation, long haul DME solution, uh, solar energy for one of our plants, because this circle which Professor has drawn is very interesting. One is transport. So we will solve the transport problems. Certainly, we are very confident. And I'm sure a lot of our competitors in this field are also doing a lot of good work in this area. When it comes to uh, industries, so we have decided out of the three plants which we have in India, one plant will run completely on renewable energy starting next year. So that's another investment which we are making. That's uh, this. The next initiative, what we are doing is BS6 which Professor talked of. Very proud to inform you, we are the first company in India which has already started manufacturing Euro 6 engines in India and we export to Europe. So the day the fuels are ready in India, Volvo will be the first company to start. We can start Euro 6 from next year. So that's, that's, the, that's the way we are. And last but not the least is our collaboration with WWF on climate saver <coughs> campaign. We have close to 16,000 employees between our joint venture and us. We believe that we can, these employees can engage with the society, with uh, lots of people around them, their families, their friends, to really take this awareness. Awareness is something very, very crucial. So these are some of the things, uh, Professor, which we intend to do. Uh, we believe that um, the key to this is embedding this approach, this technology, this mindset in your business model. Instead of taking it as a peripheral stuff that, oh, we are good citizens, we will do a bit of CSR oh, by talking, do some lip service by doing a bit of CSR on sustainability. That won't work. Sustainable solutions have to be part of your business model. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bali. I'm going to give a bit of a news which may come to such a surprise to Delhiites. If you provide clean energy access to women in villages in Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, it will have a perceptible impact on air quality in Delhi. So we have two uh, speakers on this topic. One is a pioneer, Dr. Abu Bakr from Nigeria. She has done tremendous amount of work in giving such clean energy access. So Dr. Abu Bakr, we'd love to hear from you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I know that I've been drafted in last minute. And you know you never can refuse Professor Ramanathan. When he wants to send you on an errand, you just say, yes, you'll jump, but how far? So I had to leave 
my meeting and run here to, to answer the call. It's my pleasure to be talking to you all about air quality, air pollution, and women. I'd just like all of you to take a deep breath and think about just what you're breathing in. A lot of you, if you know what you're breathing in, you will take in the air slowly. You will have respect for the air that you breathe. And it is important that we all look at air pollution from the point of saving your own life, from the point of saving your children, and from the point of the well-being of the world. One, WHO, my, my lovely friends that are here, especially my friend uh, Car Carlos Dora, everybody knows how I feel about him, is at the forefront of giving you the evidence that air pollution actually makes you ill. You do not have to be a smoker to have a heart attack from air pollution. He's going to tell you that. And that's what makes me very happy when I'm talking to politicians. When I go to the politicians and I want money, I tell them, hey, you better give me money to solve this problem or else you're going to have a heart attack. And they think, how can I have a heart attack? Yeah, well, there's secondary smoking. You don't have to be, if you, you only have to be around a smoker for you to also smoke. And so, if you think cooking with firewood because you refuse the very poor amongst us clean energy to cook, you're also liable. Air pollution does not stay where it is generated. The beautiful thing about air pollution, I love talking about it because it scares everybody. It moves around. So it's not a, a matter like in the, in the industries where you say the polluter pays. Now, if you allow the polluter to live amongst you, we all pay. And so, provision of clean energy to rural women means development. In my country, unfortunately, amongst the first 10 most polluted cities in the world, four are in Nigeria. That's not good. <coughs> In the whole world, Nigeria is the world's largest importer of diesel and petrol generators. That's not good. Nigeria, as an oil and gas country, is the second most polluted area from gas flare. That's not good. Over 98,000 Nigerian women die annually from the effects of cooking with dirty fuels, firewood, Annually, that's not good. And so, in the climate space, I got myself hooked with short-lived climate pollutants, which my friend Sunday is going to be talking about. Short-lived climate pollutant, especially black carbon, stay in the atmosphere for a very short period, but they cause a lot of havoc. Now you need to be able to connect climate change with health in the context of air pollution, but then, it's not all about bad stories. It's not about catastrophes. There are great opportunities. Now we know there are solutions. But these solutions, we should all see as business opportunities. Now, we know for, for, for a, a fact now that a new sector of the economy can be built just by provision of clean energy access to rural women. A new sector can be built in the manufacture of clean cook stoves, in the after sale services, in the fuels, cleaner fuels for the cook stoves. It doesn't have to be about poverty. You can reduce poverty from that, because we know for a fact that a lot of women that cook with firewood are already very poor. A child that reads with kerosene lantern is from a very poor family. And so, just attacking that, you provide health, you provide education, and clean the climate. The beautiful thing I want to bring to you, the solution and the success story, 
is the partnership between Nigeria and India, where we have the women I represent here is the Rural Women Energy Security Initiative. In partnership with Project Surya and Nextleaf, we are providing the verifiable climate action through the installation of sensors to clean cook stoves. So you know that as long as this woman is using the clean cook stoves, you have climate credits that would assist her to be able to afford it. However, in this whole discussion, Professor Ramanathan, I have not heard, I have not seen bankers. I have not seen the people from the financial sector. Yeah. Those are the other hands we need to shake. We are already, we've been beaten by the bug in this climate space. We know the problem. It keeps us awake. But those that will make it happen, they need to, the financial, we need the financial partners to ensure that they understand what climate finance means. They know what innovative finances mean. They know how to provide financial access to the very, very poor. That is a great untapped resource that will make a lot of people rich. We just need to let them know that these are available and we need partners in that. So with that, I want you to go away, not believing Professor Ramanathan that in a week you will forget. What I want you to do, when you get back home today, you look into the eyes of your children and tell them you're sorry. You're sorry because somehow you have contributed to making their future really grim. But promise them also that you will take action and ensure that the air that your children breathe from tomorrow has your, contributor, your contribution to making their lives much better. Thank you very much. So now you all know why I forced her out of that meeting here. We'll just finish the Hill theme uh, with really uh, someone who has worked decades on this. Most of the reports you hear from WHO starts from my neighbor, Dr. Dora's work. Please. Th thank you, Ram. Um, great pleasure to be here. Great pleasure to speak out after Bahijatu. Um, who's always a source of inspiration. I think what I'll bring to you is the idea of, uh, imagine that all the population in Delhi is smoking a few cigarettes a day, um, including children, including pregnant women, including babies in incubators, and because in fact, that's what we're talking about with air pollution. We, all, we don't buy uh, clean air in a bottle, you don't find it in a supermarket. We all share the same airspace, and we all are, are breeding from the same polluted air in a sort of a large area, as the report shows. It's not only the air polluted, uh, the pollution coming from there, it's also from outside in a, in a bit more distance. So when we talk patients, and I'm a medical doctor, uh, and I've been seeing patients, I'm also an epidemiologist, uh, we haven't yet, as a medical profession, come out to patients and started advising them of how is it that they're going to avoid this great risk to, to, to their own health. Whilst we have had a relatively amount of success, pretty good success with tobacco, with diet recommendations, with physical activity recommendations, and we haven't yet moved in that space. Um, the reason why the ministers of health of the world, including of India, decided a year and a half ago to make a vote resolution that they were going to do something about it. And then we'll have to work much more for public health through air pollution mitigation and through working with other people like the people in this table, I mean, who work in you know, transportation and waste management or uh, household <coughs> energy. Uh, the mandate from uh, those ministers came from enormous amount of science which has been accumulated over the last 15 years which says that not only air pollution is a problem for your lungs, but is a problem for your vessels. And the kinds of effects that the very small particles that go into your lungs and your bloodstream, what it does for your blood vessels is that it thickens them, it hardens them, it ends up, ends up stopping or clotting. So you end up with strokes if it's the, the blood vessel in your, is in your brain. You end, end up with a heart attack if the blood vessel affected is in your heart. And there's 
other impacts on sort of a low birth weight in children. So there's a number of other impacts which are becoming dementia, which are becoming more evident. So it is a world, a public health problem in the world of the first order. We estimate in WHO that around six and a half, seven million deaths a year are due to air, air pollution, uh, indoor and outdoors. That's the same as tobacco, and that's much worse than HIV AIDS, uh, malaria, and tuberculosis all put together. So you're really talking of a major public health crisis, and that's why the health sector feels the need to be working with the likes of you to make sure that we can create the demand, and ensure that people know what's happening to them. Because at the moment, I think there's this disconnect <clears throat> with some, you know, different people know different parts of the equation, but is everybody aware of what they're breeding is causing to their own health, to the health of the population, to, to the health of the future? So within that spirit, there's a few things that WHO are very sort of, is, is on our Monday to do that we will be contributing. It's tracking uh, the SDGs. We have responsibility over <coughs> SDG 3, SDG 7, which is household energy, SDG 11, air pollution in cities. Uh, but also making the link <coughs> between the policy solutions that you're talking about here and the air pollution certainly, but the health of the people. Because we are very rich on health data and we haven't made that connection between what's happening in the sectors and what uh, is happening with people's lives and showing that connection very clearly. In addition, we're sort of uh, talking to our patients. We have a program we're starting now to train doctors, nurses about how can they advise patients and their communities. Um, the, the tracking system, and also the evidence on what policies are better for health because of reductions in air pollution, but also because of other benefits, like if you stop using kerosene in your home, you're also avoiding intoxications of children who drink kerosene in fires. If you're using sustainable transport, like rapid bus transit, you're reducing traffic injuries. So there's a range of co-benefits which have not yet come to the equation. So we're happy to be here. We're happy to be with you, and especially thankful for the work on the report, which we think is very good work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so let me just give you a strategy here. I'm going to give a request our two remaining panelists to give five minutes talk. Then if there are two or three questions from the audience, we would love to take it. And then I have a task for Dr. Mathur. I would like you to close the session by telling us what are the next steps. So I'm giving you, I'm giving you five minutes to think about it. So our next up, uh, speaker would be Dr. Sunday Leonard. He is with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition of the United Nations Environment. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ravi. And um, I think I've, I've uh, sorry, I said Ramanathan. I've absorbed a lot from the different um, um, interventions that have been made, uh, and I will focus on the role of short-lived climate pollutant in the overall discourse uh, of air pollution. Um, several speakers in this um, um, summit have talked about the fact, about the two different um, agreements that were made last year, the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the Paris Agreement. These are very important agreements that is going to take our world, uh, prevent risk to future generation while also protecting the current uh, generation. But unfortunately, it seems as if the issue of air pollution kind of missed the boats. Many people are now rethinking the fact that air pollution should have, have its own specific goal in the, in the SDGs. Uh, when you look at the different interaction that air pollution have with uh, the different aspects of climate as well as, um, as, as well as development. But the good thing is that the Paris Agreement actually provides a linkage between climate, air pollution, and sustainable development. The Paris Agreement intends to uh, hold the increase in global temperature by 2 degrees and, if possible, by 1.5 degrees. But it also says that efforts to achieve this need to be done in the context of sustainable development and eradication of poverty. So that actually brings the discourse of, of the SDGs into the Paris Agreement. Now, there are several opportunities of bringing 
the air pollution discourse into achieving the Paris Agreement. And one of the specific ways of doing this is looking at particular air pollutant, that's three particular air pollutants, black carbon, methane, which is a precursor to tropospheric ozone. Now, these three pollutants have short lifetime in the, in the atmosphere, which means that if we mitigate them now, we can see the result of their impact on climate change within the next uh, 10 to 20 years, which is also the time frame for the sustainable development goals, which means that if we take action on, this, on them now, it can put us in a pathway that will lead us not only to achieving the SDGs, we also take care of the challenges of sustainable de of, of, uh, <coughs> of air pollution, and also we are also guaranteed to some extent of achieving our Paris target. And a recent analysis that was done by the Scientific Advisory Panel of, of uh, on the Climate and Clean Air Coalition shows that short-lived climate pollutants is actually linked to 13 of the SDGs, including the one on poverty, the one on uh, agriculture, food, uh, food security, including energy access, infrastructure, and so on. And that's why uh, I'm so interested in uh, the efforts that has been made in producing this, uh, this very important uh, report. Because most of the solutions that have been listed here, if implemented, we take care of short-lived climate pollutants as well as other, other pollutants like nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide. So by doing this, we move ourselves towards a pathway of mitigating air pollution, achieving sustainable development. So my call, and I'm going to round up now, my call is that as we seek to achieve the SDGs, as we work towards the um, implementing the NDCs, the commitment that the countries have made, India and other, all other countries. Some countries have already included um, short-lived climate pollutants in their NDCs. Countries should start co considering the idea of working more on short-lived climate pollutants. But not just that, it is also that you cannot defer the implementation of work on short-lived climate pollutants to the future. If you decide to work on it in the next 75, years or 2075, you will still reduce air pollution at that time and you will most likely still achieve your Paris Agreement as long as you also mitigate carbon dioxide. But you will not achieve the SDGs at the specified time of 2030. So the call to all countries, to India in, part, in particular, as well as all countries is let's implement the mitigation of short-lived climate pollutants so that we can put ourselves in a pathway of taking care of our health, agriculture, achieving the sustainable development goals, as well as the climate goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunday. I just want to point out the other side of this coin, this nexus between climate change and air pollution. As you know, uh, India took a historic step ratifying the climate agreement uh, on Mahatma Gandhi's birthday, October 2nd, he probably was the first global leader to worry about sustainable development. I'm talking about uh, Mahatma Gandhi. In the process, the Prime Minister Modi has announced 100 gigawatts of power would be generated by solar. That will have a huge impact on air pollution, sulfates, nitrates, soot. Why? because otherwise you would have generated that power using coal. So climate mitigation would directly mitigate some of the air pollution. So there's connections on both sides. So you have the privilege to close the panelist discussion and then I want to go to the audience for two or three questions. Okay. Mr. Fraser from uh, Vito, head of uh, Vito, yeah. Okay, thank you and thank Terry for inviting me. I'm uh, the last speaker uh, of this uh, of this session, normally the, I say then I'm standing between you and the uh, reception, so I'll keep it small. Um, at the beginning, the chairman said probably you will not remember anything uh, tomorrow or next week from this session, and I think it is clear why because everyone is agreeing, and if everyone agrees, <laughs> if there is no 
commotion, then people tend to forget there was anything seriously said. So don't expect me to bring commotion because I fully agree <laughs> with, all the previous, uh, with all the previous speakers. Um, I only want to uh, bring some um, additional points, but it are only uh, scratching a little bit of, of the surface. Air pollution, as, as he said, is a uh, solver pro problem at the same time as the, uh, was said in the introduction, by the same token, it is not yet solved. It is not yet solved in Europe. Uh, we did a vast improvement. If you look at the uh, air quality in London, in Western Europe, in Germany, in Belgium, when we compare the 1950s, 1960s to the present, at the same time, we still have from time to time an ozone problem. We still have a particulate matter problem. <coughs> Uh, so we are not there yet, but the overall picture is clear. It is a solvable problem, but we must realize it is a persistent problem. It's a persistent problem in Europe, persistent problem in the US, yeah. so uh, over annals in the world. That it does not damage your economic development, I think it's also highlighted in the report. Um, when California started working on it, when Europe started working on it, at this moment I don't think California and Europe can be described as being uh, overly delayed in his economic development. Exactly. Um, I exactly. would say the contrary. Exactly. Um, so I mean the best example is in, is in eating the pudding. Uh, so it does not contradict fighting air pollution and an economic development on the contrary. So all, yeah. even there, we, I think we all agree. Um, I think we all agree, it's all, all, also said that over the last 10, 15 years, a vast amount of knowledge has been gained um, not only on the measurements you can take, but also on how to apply them. And maybe that's the only thing I want to add. That is that um, people say the individual should be, become aware of the problem. Um, then the question is, as Dr. Matur said, it's not the individual who causes the problem. Um, mostly, and then we blame industry. Um, but industry is governed by governments. When I look at sustainable development, um, apart from the three P pillars, I always use governance as a fourth pillar. It is governments, governments and governments who will actually steer the whole problem, who must steer the whole problem. Um, and therefore, if you look at, I think it's the ninth, uh, so I endorse the report and I think they're all very good and wise uh, recommendations. If I look at, I think it's the ninth recommendation. There, the uh, equivalent is made with um, the um, um, carbon market in Europe. Um, and if we take that example, then we see that it is a very viable economical model. At the same time, we also see the pitfalls, because it did not work and for, C for CO2, for carbon, on the, on the world level, it did not work on the European level. So while it is a very economical model, very useful model, and what is the pitfall? The government. Because the government makes sure of the allocations, and then you need a very strong government uh, in India, but also in Europe, to come up with a proper allocation, which sometimes seem to contradict economic uh, interest momentarily. And finally, that's my uh, last point. Um, there is a lot of uh, knowledge available on, on the methodology. There is a lot of uh, knowledge available on how sectors interact, on how uh, methodologies interact, on how you can actually model the whole thing. It is also very wise to take into account the future. I give a classical example. Classical example is at the end of the 19th century in New York, when they started to building the bridges. People thought there was a huge problem with horse manure because all the traffic at that time was done by horses. And every horse produces a number of kilos of manure. And the estimate would be that by 1920, 1930, all the streets of New York would be covered into three meters of manure, horse manure. Less than 10 years later, there was no horse to be seen in the streets of New York because everyone was driving with uh, cars. And the same happens over here. If we hear the people from Volvo, and not only from Volvo, people from the auto industry say we are moving into electric, we know that the PM concentrations will go down. I mean, it's a fact of life. So, and I see even in Belgium, even in, in Europe, a, num a number of politicians who seem to not be able to look even in that 
small distant future where, where industry already has announced what they are going to do the next five or ten years. You, you already know, and those things need to be taken into account in order to come up with appropriate measures today, because otherwise we will either do nothing or overshoot. Um, I leave it to that and give it back to the chairman. Thank you very much. Very, very perceptive. I just want to add uh, to the horse manure story. We did not run out of Stone Age because we ran out of stones. Same way, we have to put an end to the fossil fuel. Not because we run out of fossil fuels, we have moved beyond it. So I'm, I'm going to take, we started about 10 minutes uh, late, so I'm going to take a liberty to have extra five minutes. So two burning questions, please. Chairman of Northeastern Development Foundation. First, I must thank uh, Dr. Ajay Mathur and Terry to organize such a beautiful organization. I have seen every corner here, just even from Northeast. I find people from Manipur, Meghalaya, Guwahati. The big, uh, I want to say that, as Madam Abu Bakar said, the making a smoke and cooking. There is no fuel available in Northeastern states. In Delhi, we get gas cylinder for 400 rupees. You'll get in Nagaland for 1,500 to 2,000. They are cooking, cutting forest and cooking food. Oh, and they have to make warm the house. They're doing this. In Nagaland, Mizoram, Meghalaya, Manipur, I was there for 20 days. So we started this mission. And I'm thankful to Mr. Kamal Bali and Tata. They came forward. They helped us last time. This summer we had a big program on connectivity. Now I request Dr. Mathur to help us for this climate change, this, uh, this, uh, this all ec ecological development and uh, the air pollution, which is too much there, deforestation. I need your help. Thank you. Do you want to respond, Dr. Um, I think it's something we can take up bilaterally. It's okay. not really the subject of this uh, panel Thank discussion. You. Uh, another question? Yes, sir. I think on the back. Go ahead, madam. Please. Uh, so I'm from Terry. So first of all, I would like to uh, would like to thank you all for coming to the summit. Thank you. Um, I also want to ask: when we say that air pollution is a solvable problem, do we say this keeping in mind only the metro cities? Because on paper, we may say later that by phasing out diesel vehicles, we are solving the problem. But where are these diesel vehicles going? They're going to the smaller cities outside metro cities, where they apply without any problem. You also mentioned that uh, probably providing clean flu fuel in cities like Punjab, Haryana might help. So I don't know about all the cities and all the states, but in the city of Amritsar, there are more than one lakh autos. I did a film on it, so that's why I'm aware. More than one lakh autos. And there are only three LPG stations, not even CNG stations. LPG stations 20 kilometers outside main city. And when they go to fill it up and they come back, they run out of the gases. So they end up using, again, uh, diesel or even worse, kerosene. So what is the solution in that case? And most of the times when I talk to these auto people outside Delhi, they tell us, Ki, if you want to phase out these vehicles, why are you still selling them? Why are you buying them? We are buying it because they're selling it. And I'll add one information. In 2011, the Punjab and Haryana court had uh, banned the selling of diesel autos. So the companies found a loophole. They named these autos Atul. Now they're running diesel atuls in the same city where diesel autos are banned. So could you tell me if there is a solution to that? Thank you. Yes, uh, I think yeah. it's, a, it's a perfect question. I would like to draft you into our team. We need these kind of questions to go. But I'll tell you, this is exactly the same problems California faced. Trucks outside from Nevada would come and pollute. So that is why we say that there has to be a nationwide effort first, this clean air mission. And there has to be a coordinating body. And you know, it's beyond our scope to say whether it should be an agency or a ministry or this, because that body should be able to work with all the ministries. And then we need a network. If Delhi decides they want to cut their pollution, they need to get into a discussion with the government and NCR and other states, you, that's the, why I, 
I think of it as Ashoka chakra, you know. So that circle shows it's an interconnected problem. A city cannot stand by itself and say, I'm going to solve my air pollution problem. They cannot. They have to work and figure out how to collaborate, cooperate between cities with an estate and then state to state. And then they can have a uniform uh, in our policies, etc. So, so one last question, and then yeah. I'd like to you, uh, put thank Dr. Mathur on the spot. What thank do you do sir. next? Thank you, sir. My name is Dr. Mukhtar Alam, and uh, I'm from a national organization called Center for Agriculture and Rural Development. So, <clears throat> basically, one point uh, on Ashoka Chakra, it has 24 spikes, and it calls for you know 24 Dhamma audit. That's right. Yeah. You see, for all our actions. So I think you know it's a kind of you know like now you know kind of you know climate change mitigation audit or sustainable development goal audits you know for ourselves you know personally I think just that's just a remark which I make you know that that's a kind of you know action you know which we need for you know mitigating climate change you know kind of you know 24 hours audit you know of our own actions on to what extent you know we are emitting energy now of course you know my specific question you know basically is like it. Uh, is to Sister uh, Bhaijatu Abu Bakr because, uh, like you know, of course, you know, your presentation is very because you know you are a very distinct group, ma'am. Especially you know with your entire yeah, your dress, you know, so and, and it's a very source of inspiration for us also. And I would like you to basically tell us, you know, especially in India and China because China is emitting more greenhouse gas, gas we are, emissions. We are running out of time. Can you ask Sir, your question so, quick? So yeah. I wanted you know her, uh, to give us a kind of, you know, advice, especially in women in India, uh, and uh, like giving your experience of, you know, how many, how much, how many women, you know, have been able to be, uh, sorry, how, how many women have been uh, given clean stoves there in Nigeria, and uh, like you see, like I come from a state of Bihar, we are, you know, still, uh, sorry, wood is being used, especially in North Bihar and all that. So in that way, like, you know, uh, I would like, you know, to give a message for us, especially in the states of Bihar, you know, where wood is still being used. Thank you very much. Right. And what has to be done, like for the states like uh, Bihar and That's such Robert, other places? Can I Thank request you. you to have a bilateral discussion after this? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I, I'd like to close the session that this group of 26 who got together, they are very, very interested, very motivated to see what else they can do. And, and, and in the same spirit, Dr. Mathur, uh, uh, my go California girl, Jerry Brown, met with Mr. Modi a year and a half ago and, and expressed California's interest in collaborating with uh, India. And I sent this report two days ago to him, and he immediately, it was midnight his time, he immediately replied, tell me what I need to do. So I think there is an opportunity here because Mr. Modi has started the Swachh Bharat campaign, India to become a living laboratory for the rest of the developing nations to show how to solve this problem. So could you conclude the session by sharing your wisdom about what is the next step? What do we do? Well, first of all, I think that we have looked at two very different things here. One is indoor air pollution, the other is outdoor. The causes are different, but sometimes they're the same. But clearly, the kinds of solutions that you have, the strategies you would have would be very different. Let's focus first on outdoor air pollution. As far as outdoor air pollution is concerned, we have now come to the point where we are at the stage of diminishing returns from investments in the automobile sector. Obviously, as we go to electric vehicles, it will become better. But the vast amount of pollution that occurs in almost any metro area in India is not coming from automobiles. It's coming from a variety of other sources. In the case of uh, 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 Delhi, from the burning of biomass around, from the construction yeah. that raises dust. In other words, as Professor Ramanathan said, this requires action amongst a large number of stakeholders, both within and outside Delhi. This obviously creates a problem. Just as the California Air Resources Board had a problem in how to look at Nevada, 
there is a problem in how the Delhi government would look at what is happening in Punjab and Haryana. This clearly implies the need for interstate council. That's number one. Second, even within Delhi, there is action to be done by various different organizations. We will have to start on new things. How do you control dust from construction? There are no regulations. This implies that a government agency, which is not the Ministry of Health, which is not the Ministry of, uh, or not the Department of Automobile uh, yeah. Vehicles and so on, has to change the way it works. It has to change what it measures. It has to change what it regulates. This is never easy. But I think the first thing that can be done is get hold of a few developers, get them to commit to a certain set of guidelines. As that works, then the challenges move from the few to the most. That's when regulations come in, when governments are convinced that this is something that the private sector can work on. Indoor air pollution. Move to LPG and electric induction cookers. There is no other solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I hand over the session to you. Oh, Thank you very much indeed. Now, we have the opportunity for a vote, as some of you were here yesterday afternoon experienced. I think you've all got the little voting gizmos. They're just about to be distributed to the panel. So this is where we gauge the opinion of the audience. And we're going to have voting, a voting question come up on the screen any second now. And it's a very uh, germane one, as it were, a very relevant one, given what we've been talking about. We've been talking about air pollution, how to tackle it. And the question, if we can have it on the screen, please. Right, I will start to, I will start to read it out, exactly. The question is, which sector, in your opinion, has the greatest share of responsibility for prevailing air pollution levels in Delhi in the national capital region? Is it A, transport, B, residential, C, power and industries, D, agricultural burning, E, contributions from outside of Delhi national capital region, and I guess that probably means contributions from uh, industry and so on outside, and F, that wonderful <laughs> cause of such misery in the world, others. So if you get your uh, devices ready, and I think the voting countdown starts, you have 10 seconds to vote. One of those choices starting now. Now as if by magic. Right, okay, so contrary to what Dr. Mato said, which suggests there's some education to be done, uh, the audience seem to believe that transport is still the, uh, the bulk, bears the bulk of responsibility um, and uh, the second, it's the contributions from outside, outside of Delhi, and then coming in a, uh, a low third, the, uh, the power and industrial sector. So that's interesting. Agricultural burning not showing up very highly, although the government certainly seems to think it's the prime culprit, which is interesting. Anyway, so there we are. That's an interesting gauge of opinions. Uh, do join me in thanking the panel very much for a fascinating discussion and conversation. I think we're now having a little photo opportunity for them. And meanwhile, while that's going on, after this, there will be a tea break, a short tea break, because we're running a little bit over time. Tea is happening in Plateau, which is part of the Silver Oak complex, just across the road there, or across the, uh, across the hub there. And if you can be back in a quarter of an hour for the next plenary on the climate, energy, food, and water nexus. We might have one other little announcement just coming in. Yeah, if you can uh, give your voting devices back to the, the Terry Elves at the door as you leave, please. See you in 15 minutes. Thank you.